there's a way to make an entrance. <laughs> My destiny. It was now a conspiracy of witches. Download Veely today. Whitbourne Hall is an impressive stately home set in eight acres of splendid grounds. But this great house, now divided into 23 apartments, faces an uncertain future. The residents are struggling to meet the annual renovation costs and can't agree on how best to increase revenue. Whitbourne Hall is made up not of one individual, but of 40 people. Ruth Watson has definite ideas on what needs to be done. Too many people here have got too many opinions. There's a lot of talk here. Surely things have got to change. Evolution is a painful and bloody process sometimes. Can Ruth win the community over and encourage them to pull together to save Whitbourne Hall for the future? I question how this place really is managed and run. Whitbourne Hall is a Grade II listed Palladian mansion, nestled in the Worcestershire countryside. This magnificent house was built in 1860 by the wealthy Bickerton Evans family. But over the years, they struggled to keep the estate going. In the summer of 1977, the family invited a group of friends to move into Whitbourne in return for help with its upkeep. They set up a commune-like existence in a bid to live harmoniously together. Quentin Colley was one of the original members. The ethos at that time of that group was self-sufficiency, and I suppose people could see that as being a hippie style of life. Country house communal living in Britain began in the late 1940s, but became fashionable in the 70s. The romantic dream at Whitbourne Hall, however, didn't last long. Three years later, the community disbanded and a company was formed to purchase the property for £70,000. Whitbourne is still home to an eclectic group of individuals, but the only surviving members of the original community are Quentin and his wife Heather. We still believe the house, the gardens, those are our home and it's a beautiful place to live. Today, it's a very different story from the altruistic ideal. The estate has been converted into 23 self-contained units, lived in by 37 residents. Two recent recruits are Des Dodge and Raj Sani. There's a real mix of people. I'm an engineer, Des is a hairdresser, Quentin and Heather are retired school teachers. Whitbourne prides itself on its democratic ethos. One thing, size doesn't matter here. It's a good we're, job, we're, all, we're all equal. <laughs> But with all residents having a say, decision-making is far from plain sailing. People are always going to have differences of opinion, yeah. whether it's to do with, should you have gravel outside, should you be using herbicides, should we be allowed to park here as opposed to park there? I think that's been a little pessimistic. I think on I... lots of issues, there is a consensus, isn't there? Roof repairs, refurbishment and preservation are a constant, costly concern for Whitbourne. The hall's current annual maintenance bill stands at £42,000. Next year, it's estimated at nearly double that. And the community is divided on how to solve the hall's financial woes. At the end of the day, majority rule is the name of the game. Desperate to secure the hall's future, Raj has called in businesswoman Ruth Watson in a bid to get the residents to agree on a plan of action. Today, Ruth's in Worcestershire to meet them. Hello. Hello. Welcome to you, quite literally. You must be Raj, I yes? Am. And you were the person who first contacted That's me, right. yes, on the events. Committee, yes, lovely. Hello, Ruth, I'm Des. And you're I'm chairman? The current chairman. Chairman. And Quentin, and, Quentin that's right. and you were one of the original members of the that's community yes. back in the 70s. A few lifetimes ago. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have to say, it's the most impressive portico I've ever seen. It's just amazing. Yes. I'd love to see the rest of the house, yeah. 
Ruth begins her tour in the Grand Hall, one of Whitbourne's five communal areas. This is quite extraordinary, <laughs> isn't it? Everything about it. I feel as if I'm in some kind of huge Roman baths or something or other. The glass roof in good order? Um, reasonable order in, in the fact that it's now watertight. Um, we've had a lot of work done on the roof and the lanterns above the, what, what you actually see. However, there's a fair bit of work to do on the plaster work. Uh, it's, it's all interior now, so mm. it's all decorative. Built 150 years ago, Whitbourne Hall is designed to impress on every level. And the gilded drawing room is no exception. Now, I expected it to be big, but what I didn't expect was it to be quite so beautiful. I mean, it's just really mm. charming. We do know that each panel that we have here for the windows originally in 1860 um, cost um, £970. Per yes. window? Per window, which is roughly the cost of building the stable block at the back of the house. My so, God, so it was obviously pure gold leaf. Absolutely, yes, it, presumably it would be. To keep costs down, residents share general upkeep between themselves, from keeping the gardens in trim to preserving the intricate fabric of the building. We got it replastered, new buildings put on, and over the last year we've been painting it. So who, who, I mean, gilding is a craft. Who does the gilding? Well, there are a number of us that are talented in the respect we can hold a paintbrush, and we've just had to copy what was here already. We do all the outside work ourselves, except for cutting the hedges. There's a group of people here still willing to put their time into cutting grass. And in fact, I'd say that people fight over who, who gets to do the lawn. It's yeah. such a privileged job. <laughs> and I bet it's the men fighting, not <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> to generate an income, Whitbourne Hall hosts weddings. It's licensed to hold 12 a year, but is failing to achieve this figure. How many weddings have you got planned for this coming year? Five. Five. We Would you like to do more? I, I'm going to get shot here. I personally <laughs> don't have a problem with having a lot more weddings. Um, however, I do feel that other people in the house may have problems with that. Right. So, five, you're not even got 50% of what you could do. Weddings bring in little revenue. To get to the bottom of the estate's finances, Ruth and the residents retire to the library. I'd like to understand the finances better of the house, because it's obviously not a cheap place to run. We have a service charge, which obviously um, each unit contributes to. How much and, is that? And that is 22,000 a year. So approximately 1,000 pounds per residence? Yes. Yep. Um, and then in addition to that, of course, it's the, um, the events that we hold here. Right. And that equates between 12 and 15,000 a year. In terms of profit or turnover? Turnover. Turnover. Right, so that's not a contribution, is it, as such? It's whatever the profit you're making from it is. OK, and how much do you think the house costs to run? This year's budget is 42000 So, at the moment, your total income is via the service charge, and that's in the region of 22000 mm -hmm. You have, should have income from events, but there's a question mark about whether they really are contributing. Um, so there is actually a whacking great shortfall, isn't there? Yes. In the past, Whitbourne met major renovation costs by selling vacant apartments. But the last one has sold for £150,000. And now the residents need to find alternative ways to raise cash. Have the residents had any other thoughts about ways and means of uh, procuring more income? Mm, potters, mm. art, um, art displays in the house mm. uh, as a possibility. Um, local shows being held here. Right. But we're not talking about large amounts of money, and this is the no, problem. No, no. It's one of the worries that people have, that any activities you do here might impinge on their enjoyment of the hall. That's right. I, that is a major concern of most of the residents. There's going to have to be a balance, a trade-off, between intrusion on people's lives and the necessary money that's got to be raised to keep the place renovated and running. With the opinions of nearly 40 people to consider, 
Ruth's got her work cut out if she's to find an agreeable, viable solution. What seems to be the problem, not enough money, but also residents who may or may not like the idea of more things occurring here. The fact is they bought these flats because they were peaceful and quiet. And the idea of sharing this house with a lot of people celebrating weddings and the like, I don't think it's going to go down very well with everybody. Whitbourne Hall is in crisis. Without help, the crumbling building and its ethos could be lost forever. I think the hall has to decide whether it's a hobby or a business. But has Ruth come up with a radical resolution to Whitbourne's democratic failings? I'm in favour of a despot, a dictator, taking over here. Magnificent Whitbourne Hall in Worcestershire was built by wealthy vinegar magnate Edward Bickerton Evans in the mid-1800s as a testament to his success. The mansion was constructed in the Greek Revival style, inspired by extravagant expeditions to Europe. Its impressive portico boasts six ionic fluted pillars. Each 30 feet in height, they are slightly barrel-shaped to give a correct sense of proportion to the eye. The house also has one of the largest glass ceilings in any private residence in Europe and a now derelict palm house. The Bickerton Evans resided at Whitbourne for over a century. Then in 1977, the ailing mansion became home to a community of friends who resided here as a family, living, eating and working the land together. Three years later, they disbanded and formed a company to buy the property. Today, Whitbourne Hall is home to 37 residents who live in 23 self-contained apartments. Despite its fine appearance, the hall is in need of constant repair. This year's maintenance bill is £42,000 and next year it's expected to double. But revenue from the annual service charge and events are failing to reach anywhere near that amount. Ruth Watson has been called in to help secure Whitbourne's future by Raj Sani. With a house of this size, one can never underestimate the amount of work that may suddenly need doing. Ruth's on a mission to find practical answers to the estate's financial problems. But before she comes up with a plan, she needs to canvass the opinions of as many residents as possible. Her first port of call is Quentin and Heather Colley, who were part of the original community. Well, this is nice. You've got a view of the palm house. Oh, yes. So how long have you actually been living here? We came in October 1977. My goodness. And then you all lived tout ensemble in the house to That's begin right. with. we did. What made you decide that you needed your individual accommodation? Trying to share bathrooms. I think we were getting a bit tired of all eating together mm. all the time. How much do you feel that the original concept of community living still exists? If people are being, in one's opinion, slightly unreasonable, you have to deal with it with a public face. But mm. it, somewhere along the line, that pressure's got to be released, hasn't it? Mm. So you can come in here and... Have a little hiss. <laughs> it's just as well that nobody's got a bug in here. <laughs> what would you think is the best way forward in terms of actually producing more income for the house? I think if the house could earn its living Monday to Friday so that when everybody else came back at the weekends, we could all enjoy it together, it would be great. Maintaining the hall's tranquility is also top of the agenda for Captain Cliff McFarlane, who lives above one of the hall's main function rooms. I think it's in the balance of raising revenue, mm. but not disturbing uh, us too much, because we live here. Mm. But do you think that's actually possible? Um, I think the special events that would be in keeping, art shows, yoga and um, other practices. Yeah, so quiet things. <laughs> I would prefer quiet things. <laughs> The staging of events at Whitbourne is clearly a sensitive issue. One way to boost revenue while ensuring serenity 
could be to increase the £1,000 flat rate annual service charge. But the size of apartments varies dramatically, and not everyone is in agreement with such a proposal. Yeah. So you're... David, Dave, how did you do? How do you hand. do? Dave, yeah. you bought your own little unit? Yes, yes. I say little, it's maybe yeah. huge, is it? Well, mine is one of the smallest, actually. Right. It's where the butler lived, the butler's pantry. In the butler's pantry? Yeah. The whole yeah. flat? It's yeah. just the butler's pantry. Margaret, Rodney, do you think you pay enough service charge? Yes. Do you think it's right and fair that everyone pays exactly the same regardless of the size of their yeah. apartment? Yes. You pay the same service charge as everybody else, yes. even the five-room apartments. I mean, yes. do you think that's equitable? I think it is an unfair... Deep down, I do think it's a very unfair system. It's become a sort of posh block of flats with some... Uh, you know, that's how it is now. <laughs> Previously, Whitbourne was in the luxurious position of having a solution to any funding crisis. Over the years, the way money's been raised here is by selling things off. They've sold off the stables, they've sold off apartments, but now they've reached the end of the road. So from now on in, they've got to find money from another source. With the last flat sold, Whitbourne needs to become commercial while still remaining a home. Town clerk Richard Chapman moved in only 18 months ago and has already recognised this. There's a lot of talk here. I'm quite happy to live here as we are, but if they want more business to support the house, then surely things have got to change. Mm. So your personal view, how would you take this forward? Well, I think I would investigate the daytime conferences. Mm -hmm. I think the hall has to decide whether it's a hobby or a business. Over the years, the way of life at Whitbourne has evolved from its classless roots. It's now home to a broad range of inhabitants, from retired pensioners to working professionals. Keeping everyone satisfied is a delicate process, as Raj Sani, who came here four years ago, has come to realise. Do you think that running events successfully is the way out of the problem? I do. I personally have no restrictions on the number of events yeah. and the type of events that we hold. Yeah. The downside is that you really do have to pay attention to every little single thing because you have the potential of upsetting people quite mm. easily. Mm. There has been um, some disharmony. It, it, I've experienced it. What would your individual tack be on how to get more money in here? That's why I got you in. <laughs> <laughs> Individual tack yes, to do this. <laughs> Ruth has discovered that there's certainly no shortage of opinions at Whitbourne, and, as a result, little consensus. This house desperately needs a good income stream, so right now I'm in favour of a despot, a dictator, taking over here. The residents are willing to become commercial, but only on their own terms. So Ruth needs to find a solution that will preserve their privacy while still bringing in revenue. One option is to take advantage of the hall's idyllic location. Ruth visits a farm eight miles from Whitbourne to meet Mark Gordon, an entrepreneur who markets a novel way of making a profit from tranquil, rural settings. This is really amazing. <laughs> Featherdown Farms is a new concept in holiday accommodation that celebrates outdoor living. It combines comfortable camping in homely tents with added mod cons. This is absolutely lovely. I mean, there's so much attention to detail. It's really quite sophisticated in its rusticness and the, the sleeping arrangements. There are three bedrooms. Just yeah. behind you, there's a little hideaway one for the children where they not only sleep but they... Play. It's great. And, and what about for adults, though? Proper um, bed? Comfortable master bedroom out the back and then two bunk beds in the adjoining bedroom. And you've got a real proper table which you can sit, eat, drink, read, talk. I'm completely convinced of its idyllic nature. I mean, this is everyone's dream, but tell me more about the commercial side of things. A couple of crews come over at the beginning of the season and they put the tents up and then at the end of the season they take them down again. And 
how popular are they? Well, they've um, been going for three years now and they've been booked out, really. Um, really? We've had to put up the um, full sign, um, usually shortly into the season. Uh, and what sort of rents do people have to pay to come and stay, an average? Average of about £400 for um, a, a weekend or a midweek break here. And what's in it for the landowner? Um, the farmer will get a fixed sum of money every time the uh, tent is full. The most successful locations turn over £30,000 a year. But Ruth wonders how this could work for a country house like Whitbourne. Now I have a problem because I love this concept, but the house I have in mind is not a working farm. It's a very large country house. Mm. I mean, uh, no hope for them? No, that shouldn't be a problem at all because we've got a new product in development called Hideaway Homes. And these will be situated um, next to country houses instead of next to working farms. Right. Uh, and the theming, instead of being a farm theme, will be around the 19th century and exploration. Ruth's also aware that residents would prefer events to take place on weekdays and thinks the communal rooms at Whitbourne could be utilised effectively to bring peace, harmony and revenue. Ruth's come to try yoga in London's fashionable Primrose Hill to meet ex-lawyer Jonathan Satin, who's made spiritual exercise good business. Now, obviously you're in a city doing this. Do you think yoga works in rural areas? Is there a call for it? I think yoga can work anywhere. Yeah. I think it is location driven. You can run retreat sites, which yeah. people obviously do. And I think, um, it's not quite if you build it, they will come, but I think that if you have a very good teacher and you have a good environment and you're teaching the right styles of yoga and you price it correctly, it should work. Is there an optimum class size? I think um, if you're running a retreat, uh, 20 is a good number. Mm. I think you can transport this into a lot of different places. I think um, you could run these in country houses. Yeah. You can do it. One day courses during the week could earn Whitbourne around £15,000 a year while still maintaining the residents' privacy. Encouraged by her research, Ruth's back in Worcestershire to present her findings to the residents at Whitbourne Hall. First of all, I'd just like to say to you that the success of this house is down to you. It's only the way it is because a dedicated band of people have worked very, very hard on keeping it the way it is now. First, Ruth tackles the thorny issue of the property's annual service charge. Your running costs exceed the service charge by about £10,000 a year. So my first suggestion, which will not be music to your ears, is that the service charge is going to have to go up. So to my mind, the equitable way of going about this is to do it by square footage. But I really do think that it's fundamental that running costs are met annually by service charges. So we now get to the how you get an income stream in. Ruth firmly believes that the splendid mansion should be attracting more weddings. Weddings are top of the list because that's the place where most people are prepared to spend a lot of money. Those weddings, I don't think, should realise you as profit anything less than £4,000. It has to be professionally done. If you were to interview and hire a wedding planner and you said, what we want from you is a fee for use of location and that sum has not got to be less than £4,000. If you were to say you can do 12 events at £4,000 a year profit making, I think that's entirely realisable. I like your thing about a wedding planner. I think that that would work very well because I think it would take pressure off the people in the house. But I would have thought we could have done more daytime conferences here. Um, it doesn't strike me as being the absolute obvious place to have conference events because unfortunately you're up against hotels and places which are so, so well geared up to it. Licensed to operate 12 events per year, Whitbourne should be making £48,000 from weddings alone. And they could be realising even more by capitalising on the hall's peaceful location. There is a company called Featherdown that have set up on working farms, I have to say, this sort of glorified 
tents, but they are so much more than tents. They are actually rolling out another model, which is to do with country houses, and it's um, called hideaway homes. Now, not only are they lovely for guests to come and stay in, but actually they're very lovely for the landowners because you get a cut from the, the rent that's paid. Now, it did seem to me to fit in with the ethos of what you were doing here because it's essentially quiet. As well as luxury camping, Ruth's keen for the hall to make use of the grand communal rooms on weekdays. You obviously could try the idea of, of yoga retreats as well. Um, I think, again, it fits in with your ethos and there are lots of people prepared to spend quite a lot of money to go away for a week to do yoga and you would obviously have to get professionals in. I totally accept I'm speaking from a, a point of view of somebody who has never done yoga in their life and couldn't. <laughs> <laughs> Ruth's parting shot is to get the residents to stop talking and start working. I'd like to charge you with the notion that you would trial the Featherdown Farms thing just to see how it worked. I mean, it would be good for you, it'd be good for them, you know. Is it a concept that you could roll out or not? Um, I think it'd be a good idea to see if you can contact some yoga centres to see whether they would like to come and do some yoga here. And I also think that you ought to be trying to find a wedding planner. So when I come back, I'll be very interested to hear how things have gone on. But in the meantime, thank you very much for your time. Thank and you. I should wend my way. Remarkably, Ruth's suggestions appear to have gone down well with the residents. But the honeymoon period doesn't last long. Raj, I'm going to stop you. How many people have you got signed up? We've got two. Right. I don't need to go any further. Whitbourne Hall, set in the heart of the Worcestershire countryside, is in financial trouble. With little revenue coming in to fund ongoing renovation, the residents are at odds as to how best to generate a healthy income. Raj Sani moved here just four years ago but has already become frustrated. Whitbourne Hall is made up not of one individual, but of 40 people. You are bound to get some people who are very calm and placid and go with the flow, and then you're also bound to get people who aren't. To help the community agree on a way forward, Ruth Watson's come up with a range of money-making objectives, but the initial enthusiasm has waned. There was a lot more discussion, a lot more debate, a lot more dissent, really. I'm aware of the fact that evolution is a, a painful and bloody process sometimes. No decision has been made on increasing the service charge, and residents are against the notion of daytime courses in yoga. When this was mentioned in the company meeting, there was um, a lot of laughter. Why should Ruth feel that that was appropriate for us? But Raj is determined to act on Ruth's suggestions. I thought potentially there might not be a lot of money in yoga, but an area associated with um, growth and with personal development is NLP. Neuro-linguistic programming claims to train the brain to think more positively. Raj is convinced that such classes would fit in perfectly with the sedate atmosphere at Whitbourne. Tom Mackay, an NLP expert from London, has come to meet Raj and fellow resident Des Dodge with a view to running weekday courses here. Tom, um, we talk about NLP. What exactly you know, does that encompass? What, you know, what is it about? It's often described as the technology of achievement. So it's about how we think, how we manage our emotions, and how we even use our physiology to achieve more success in any area. So it's about how we can communicate better with other people, but also how we communicate better with ourselves. It is a question of taking you out of your comfort zone, in a way. Yeah. So you don't do any hypnosis? A lot of the techniques are quite hypnotic, although they're not specifically what we call hypnosis. Mm. Uh, had, you, had you time in mind, like a time scale in mind? Well, we have a wedding that first weekend in September, September but so... thereafter we're okay, thereafter, aren't we? we're free. Yeah. Okay. With people willing to pay up to £95 for NLP day courses, this could prove a trouble-free and lucrative revenue stream for Whitbourne. 
It's a wonderful setting, and it's probably the most serene and peaceful place that I'd, I'd have run a course in. The fact is that the house is empty during the week. Um, I think um, putting workshops on is, is, a, is a very good and suitable way of using the space we've got. Uh, I think it's got huge potential. But courses alone won't go anywhere near keeping the estate afloat. Ruth Watson has got wind of dissent among the residents at Whitbourne. Determined not to allow them to scupper her plans, she's back in Worcestershire to confront them. I can't help feeling that the structure of how this house is run has somehow got to change because I think that's where the future, the success of Whitbourne Hall, its survival, that's where it all lies. Ruth's main concern is that any progress at Whitbourne is being hampered by the community's egalitarian ideals. I don't think that you're a genuine democracy because I don't think everyone has a real vote all the time. And I question how this place really is managed and run because to me it dibs and dabs from certain areas and, and, and certain ethoses and certain conventions and it doesn't add up in my head to a whole. Cliff, what are your thoughts? I like the way we sort of get together and, and we discuss things mm -hmm. and we work it out. It does take longer mm -hmm. uh, to do that, but I think we actually achieve a more comfortable solution. I think that, that for me, the comfortableness is probably what I am uncomfortable about. <laughs> if it does mean that this house is in peril in some way financially because you don't raise enough money to keep it going and to look after it, then you know, the comfort to me has to be secondary. It's how this works viably in, I'm afraid, a slightly business way. Weighed down by bureaucracy, Ruth thinks the residents aren't being entirely open about their feelings. She's drafted a survey to assess what they truly think of the hall's infrastructure. And to ensure total honesty, it's to be completed anonymously. I would like every single resident here to actually fill in this form. I just think that it would then give you a little bit of an opportunity to make changes should they be needed or to see you know, whether, whether the, the majority of people think this does work as well as it possibly could. The survey covers a wide range of issues, from what the community think of the management structure to the issue of the annual service charge. I do think the effort that you make is absolutely unquestionable. You know, you all care and you all work hard. But I think the effectiveness of what you all do I think has to be really, uh, you know, tightened up. Ruth is struggling to get the residents to agree on a way forward, but they do consent to trial upmarket camping in the secluded grounds. If the trial proves a success, Whitbourne will need more than their eight acres of land, but could gain access to neighboring fields. With the tent up, the residents are finally pulling together and putting the finishing touches to the newest residents at Whitbourne. Anybody want some music while they work? How are they supposed to get up to that top bunk? Run and jump, all right. I was going to say something, Ben, but it might be misconstrued. As part of the deal, Tents are erected at the beginning of the holiday season. All the residents would have to do is coordinate arrivals, departures and laundry once a week. Ruth is back at Whitbourne to check on progress. I've come to see the posh camping trial. There's no one in the house, so I'm hoping that they're all up there doing something. This is incredible. Hello. Oh, hello. Hi, Ruth. This is How are you? So great. <laughs> Super. Just take a look at the bedroom. <gasps> a proper six foot bed. I feel like I want to go and hack steaks off live beasts and, you know, get out there and grill them. <laughs> it's great. It actually fits in. 
Yeah. I think, that yeah, two no, of us I are do Andy. too. Seriously, thinking of moving in here and letting out the flat. I, I, I don't <laughs> blame you. I think it's utterly delightful. I really, really do. I'm to totally taken with it. Is everyone on board for this? I mean, any dissenting voices? Well, I, 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 we haven't heard as yet. Yeah. But the fact is, because it's very new, because it's only just gone up. Right. Um, you know, I think there's yet there's a few that possibly haven't seen. Haven't seen that it. May or may but, not. Think. But everyone who's seen it has been suitably impressed. Mm -hmm. I hope. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Yeah. But as in all democracies there's often opposition. Richard Chapman is leading the rebellion. I think they think it's wonderful, um, and I think they see it as a, a panacea. Um, but I'm sceptical about it. The, the, the place won't be our own, because we will have people here all the time. I, I don't think it would suit the hall. Six willing volunteers and their dog have been drafted in to put the Whitbourne camping trial to the test. Quentin is on hand to welcome them. This is the campsite. Wow. <laughs> and that's in the campsite. The guests are more accustomed to a hotel when it comes to holidays. Oh, that's nice and solid, isn't it? So the notion of country house camping will be put to the ultimate test. <laughs> Hello. As well as being self-sufficient, holidaymakers are encouraged to be eco-friendly too, even down to generating the electricity. For Ruth, she's simply pleased to see some action at Whitbourne Hall. <laughs> As far as I'm concerned, this posh camping is fantastic. I love the notion of it. Whether it will be a success, I don't know. What I am finding, though, is that the key players here, the people who actually are on the board, as it were, are really beginning to realise that, A, this must be run on more commercial principles, and B, that they're the ones doing all the work. Too many people here have got too many opinions, but they're not putting their money where their mouth is. Yeah, excellent. After a comfortable night, the reluctant campers are up early for a hearty breakfast. Oh, yum. Good mushrooms. Mm. It always tastes better when it's cooked outside, doesn't it? It does. And Ruth is back to see how they fared. Did you enjoy it? We did. We did, yeah. Very much. yeah. We had really good fun. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's good. And you had a shower? Yeah. How was that? Good. And what about the grown-ups? How did you find um, lighting fires and making water hot and things like that? Yeah, the fires were fine. Got them going this morning within about 20 minutes, half an hour. Yeah. No problems with that. How much do you think that's important, that you're in the grounds of a big country house and that you could have access to it and perhaps it's more formal grounds? I think that's very important because otherwise it would have just been a campsite. We could have mm. been anywhere, but to, to be on the grounds of a lovely, stately home, it just made it very special. Mm. Feels very safe as well for the for the children. Yeah. And the dog as well. Yeah. I mean, I really don't like camping, so this was this, this so is So you're good different. test people so, then. Yeah, very good <laughs> test people. Would you come and do this again, do you think? Yes, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. So success? I think oh, so. Very, very much, much yeah. so. Yeah. With some judicious planning, a village of six tents could turn over thirty thousand pounds a year if the residents agree to it. The most effortless way for Whitbourne to increase revenue is to host more lucrative weddings. But in the last six months, the residents have failed to acquire the services of a wedding planner or increase their five original bookings. Ruth is not happy. There's something going wrong about the way you're selling them. I'm dealing with houses that are nothing like as marvellous as this, with nothing like as good gardens, who are easily getting 40, 50, 60 weddings a year. I don't know whether it's to do with selling technique, I don't know whether you as a body of people are putting up too many obstacles about where people can do it, what they can do, but something is going wrong. I suspect that if there are too many reservations about what people can and can't do, then that's one of the problems. Ruth's also far from impressed by the progress that's been made in arranging weekday courses. Now, I had suggested doing yoga, but you are 
um, going ahead with the NLP, but it is a struggle to get the right number of people, and Raj, you put an enormous amount of work and time into it. The reason that I chose NLP mm. is that it has a crossover. Mm -hmm. It has a large personal um, market. Raj, I'm going to stop you. To... How many people have you got signed up? We've got two. Right, and how much work have you done? How many hours? A lot. Exactly. I don't need to go any further. It's not a model that works. My belief is that you have expended a lot of energy on the NLP and that if that similar amount of energy had been put into the yoga, you probably would have got a better response. Ruth leaves Whitbourne Hall disappointed by the distinct lack of progress. At the moment, we're still wading through this sort of democratic soup. This house, if it's going to survive in this new era, has got to be run on more commercial footings. And that means they do have to do events and they basically do have to stop conferring about every single last thread of the carpet. Over the next two weeks, Raj pulls out all the stops to make her trial NLP course a success. Raj is also attending and has managed to triple the number of attendees. Instructor Tom Mackay is sharing his ethos of a happy state of mind with the class. Find that time you felt really confident. That's it. Go back to that time, see what you saw, hear what you heard. Really feel those feelings of confidence increasing. Imagine with every breath you can find yourself feeling more and more confident, even more confident. Let it grow stronger and stronger with every breath. More and more confident, more and more confident. Very good, very good. Great. Good. Just 12 NLP day courses per year could bring in around £12,000. If you can do something that seemed impossible, you know, what else can you do that seemed impossible as well? Coupled with the income from weddings and upmarket camping, this could secure Whitbourne's future. It's going. Yeah, it's going. It's going, yes! Autumn. The all-important results of Ruth's survey are in. That's a bit of a knock. That one stings. And the residents are surprised at some of the conclusions. For those that tend to say too much, for them to stop and think. Well, that would save a lot of bother, wouldn't it? I am not making any comment. It's an important day at Whitbourne Hall. Ruth Watson has conducted an anonymous survey of residents. And the results are out today. Look what I've got, the survey results. Oh, brilliant, right. I'm obviously That's not getting enough. it right. That's fair enough. Well, I need to have, I need to have longer to, to look at this. This is obviously quite detailed. Um, the questionnaire has revealed some surprising conclusions. 61% feel that communication between the management team and the residents needs to be improved. That's a bit of a knock. That one stings. And one third think their opinions aren't being heard. For those that tend to say too much, for them to stop and think. I am not making any comment. I genuinely believe that the people who push here are pushing for Whitbourne, not for themselves. Mm. And this is where people are taking it too personally. I mean, at the end mm. of the day, it's, it's those that do the pushing that get the mm. jobs done. What it says, leaseholders need to be honest and say what they really think. Yeah. Well, that would save a lot of bother, wouldn't it? One contentious suggestion made by Ruth is to raise the annual service charge. But the questionnaire reveals that 89% think it would be prudent to do so. I think that's a fairly that's obvious a strong majority. One. That's a strong one. For some residents, like Dave Goodman, who's lived at Whitbourne for over 20 years, an increase would not be such good news. I mean, it might uh, mean that because the service charge is going up too, too much for me, that I might have to make plans a bit earlier to, to move, definitely. You know, it is, it is a very sad fact. It's seven months since Ruth's first visit to Whitbourne, and she's back to meet the residents for the last time. The real point about this is that you've gone from 
the community that you mm. talk about to something which is not a community. There are aspects of it which are still communal, and then there's some other bits which are completely commercial. And this is really the, the nub of the problem. We still believe in the, the, the ethos, if you like, of the community, even though it possibly does throw up quite a few interesting moments <laughs> and what have you. But we, we get over those, yeah. we get round them. The problem is that that relies on the people who have that ethos. And I'm looking, you know, 30, 40, 50 years down the line at the future of this house, when, by necessity, those people will not be here. The residents are in the process of considering running day courses and glamorous camping at Whitbourne. But Ruth thinks they're still missing a trick. My vote is still for weddings as your most obvious, easiest route. Mm. Um, I don't know whether you, we've improved on the figure for next year, have we? Not yet. Not yet. But we have got quite a lot of um, inquiries in the pipeline. I think this needs to be put on a professional footing because this is the easiest, quickest source of making money for this place. Over the months, Ruth has struggled to motivate the residents, but at least her hard work hasn't gone completely unnoticed. I think it's been a very worthwhile exercise. It made me realise just what we have going for us. I'd actually say you've acted as a catalyst, mm. and it's something that is needed. Perhaps we would have got there eventually, but you've just speeded us up slightly. <laughs> I mean, I would run a mile from all these meetings. I just, you know, it's just not for me. I think you're all completely crazy living here. Um, <laughs> please find a way to raise the service charge because that will initially just really resolve all the immediate problems about what you've got in the kitty. Let's drive on with this wedding thing. Take the easy route. Mm. That's what I would like you to do is take the easy route. Hopefully, Ruth having come here will motivate people into taking some action. People will think, OK, you know, we do have to share the hall. We do need to bring in some extra revenue. Um, otherwise, there is a danger of things falling apart. <laughs>